Have you ever thought about how branding cattle might be related to branding teachers? No? Well, think again. In the 1980s, William Sanders, an adjunct professor of agriculture at the University of Tennessee, applied a statistical mixed model used to assess and predict genetic trends and breeding methods among livestock to the field of education. Using best linear unbiased predictions, Sanders and his colleagues further developed this methodology to link students' achievement in school with their teachers. He thought, as with cattle, he could do this to determine the effects that individual teachers, schools, and districts had on student learning. By doing this, he began to measure a teacher's value added. Fast forward to the 21st century, during which educational policies and initiatives such as No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top promulgated the education system, focusing more on teachers than the students themselves. For the first time in history, statisticians claim they can help states and districts thoroughly identify good and bad teachers using student test scores and value-added models. Investing in the model will allow you to do these things in return. Researchers agree that snapshot measurements of student achievement and traditional teacher evaluations tell us quite little about true teacher effectiveness. In fact, virtually no evidence suggests the use of value-added models actually improves teaching, and more importantly, increases student learning or achievement. At the same time, we know a lot about the errors and inconsistencies that continue to prevent its practicality. Despite these issues across the country, a sense of urgency for states to develop their own value-added models has emerged, oftentimes regardless of whether educational leaders thoroughly understand the issues or what the unintended consequences are. Looking at Sanders' value-added model in particular, the Education Value-Added Assessment System, it has since been proclaimed to be the best, most reliable, and the most educationally beneficial value-added model in the country. According to SAS, the EVOS provides educational consumers valuable diagnostic information about instructional practices, helps educators make more sound instructional choices, and helps teachers use resources more strategically to ensure that every student has the chance to succeed. Sounds great, right? So we decided to see what was happening with teachers in the school district using the EVOS. The Houston Independent School District is the largest school district in Texas, the seventh largest district in the nation. HISD has been using the EVOS model as part of its Accelerating Student Progress Increasing Results and Expectations, or ASPIRE program, since the 2006-2007 school year. Within this program, teachers receive VA scores based on the progress their students make as compared to other similar teachers within the district on the state standardized tests over time. After each teacher's value added is calculated, then the district ranks the teacher's VA scores. Those with positive scores are labeled as relatively more effective teachers, and in Houston they receive differentiated bonuses accordingly. But wait, you're probably wondering what happens to those teachers of grade levels and subjects that do not have standardized tests. Most states can only generate growth scores for language, arts, and math teachers for grades 4 to 8. In HISD, 3 to 8 grade teachers in language arts, math, science, and social studies receive EVOS scores. The other teachers receive an EVOS score based on a composite from all the EVOS eligible teachers in their school. So wait, even if I'm an amazing second grade teacher, the other teachers can make more money than me because I can't get my own EVOS scores? Um, yes, that's exactly right. Oh, it gets even more complicated than that. In addition to the Aspire program, HISD teachers also receive supervisors' observations based on numerous domains of teaching. You would assume these numbers would correlate so that if a teacher scores highly on the EVOS, their appraisal score would be high as well. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. In HISD, we found over 50% of the teachers who participated in a survey did not have similar EVOS and appraisal scores. You're telling me that I might score highly on the EVOS and yet my principal observation scores could be low? Yes, or the opposite. 
In fact, in the state of Tennessee and New York, teachers are aware of their principals skewing their observation scores to match the EVOS data so they do not have to defend their more subjective scores in front of their bosses or other administrators. So, even though my principal observes my teaching on more than one occasion and thinks I do a great job, they'll change or disregard those scores if my EVOS scores are low? Possibly. Or the opposite. This is really confusing. Why on earth would it be that two measures developed to evaluate teacher effectiveness wouldn't produce similar results? There's more. In the spring of 2011, 221 HISD teachers were terminated. A number of these teachers' contracts were not renewed, at least in part, due to a significant lack of student progress attributable to the educator, or insufficient teacher academic growth reflected by value-added scores. We also studied the case of four of these HISD teachers. To illustrate what happened, we'll start by examining their data case by case and then overall. Notice that teacher A taught more or less the same subject areas across grade levels. Half of the time she was considered an effective teacher, and the other half ineffective. Essentially, her effectiveness was no different than if it was determined by flipping a coin. This is what unreliable data looks like. Well, that certainly doesn't seem like she should have been terminated due to, at least in part, these scores. We know, but this is what happened. And this was the reasoning given in her termination papers. But let's move on to Teacher B. Teacher B had three years EVOS scores from teaching 7th grade math before her contract was not renewed. She showed negative growth the first two years and positive growth for her most recent year, the year she was terminated. But wasn't her last year her best? Yes. And she was terminated because of these scores? At least in part, yes. But let's move on. Here, Teacher C, we see what we would expect if value-added scores were indeed valid. It seems we have a very clear indication that Teacher C is detracting value across the 6th grade subject areas she taught. If we were all to look at Teacher C's data, we could all agree that this is one teacher that probably does deserve to be terminated, right? Right. These scores look valid, right? Right. But again, let's investigate further. As illustrated, Teacher C showed negative growth each of the four years she had EVOS data. However, Teacher C taught some of the highest needs students in the district. Approximately 50% of her students had been retained in grade one to four times, and the ages of her sixth grade students ranged from 10 to 15 years old. In addition, she exceeded expectations across almost every domain in terms of her supervisor evaluations. She was also given a Teacher of the Year award during the 2007-2008 school year by her peers. This just doesn't seem right. Teacher D's first three years of data were much like Teacher A's, no difference than the flip of a coin. Teacher D demonstrated added value 50% of the time and detracted value the other 50%. Again, for her first three years. Her fourth year, however, she taught a fourth grade transition year, when English language learners were transitioned into her English-only classroom. That year, she showed negative growth in all subjects across the board. This is what we call bias. While EVOS developers in particular insist that students' language and other background variables do not bias value-added scores, evidence here and elsewhere suggests this is not true. In fact, most value-added academics who critique model components argue that without the random assignment of students' classrooms, never will such assertions be made about teachers with any acceptable level or reliability, accuracy, or fairness. This still doesn't make sense, but what happened? In the end, teachers A, B, and D pursued their due process hearings, but they decided not to follow their hearings through to culmination. They ultimately decided to quit teaching in Houston or left the teaching profession altogether. Oh my, what happened to teacher C? She's the one who, according to her EVOS data, seemed to have detracted value from her students' learning across the board. Well, teacher C took her case through to her due process hearing. Her hearing officer noted that the types of students Teacher C typically taught most likely biased her capacity to demonstrate value added and show growth. 
The hearing officer also noted that Teacher C did not have multiple years of consistent data in the core subject areas where she taught to warrant a decision regarding whether she was indeed an effective teacher, so she got her job back. But this overall finding from this part of this study was that it seems the district is inappropriately using inconsistent data within and across subject areas to make high-stakes decisions about teachers, and in this case, teacher termination. What's worse is that none of the four teachers understood their EVOS data, none used their data to inform or improve their instruction, and none were provided professional development to purportedly make them better teachers. This dismisses the claims made by those selling the EVOS for profit that the EVOS helps schools get better. In addition, we found that teachers have compared winning an Aspire bonus based on their EVOS scores to winning the lottery. Some years they get bonuses and other years they do not, but they feel their teaching strategies stay the same. Instead, they believe it's the students they teach that truly influence their EVOS scores, not their effectiveness as teachers. Additionally, teachers of gifted and talented students receive some of the lowest EVOS scores due to lack of stretch in the assessments or ceiling effects. Teachers of special education or non-English speaking students, particularly in the fourth grade, claim to have the hardest time demonstrating value added on the EVOS when compared to other teachers in the district. In fact, teachers have mentioned avoiding certain types of students or the subject areas and grade levels that count. Another scenario described by teachers is the flip-flop effect, whereas teachers switch EVOS rankings as a result of different teaching segments. For example, an 8th grade science teacher who consistently received low EVOS scores switched with a high-value added 6th grade science teacher and thereafter posted the highest EVOS scores on campus. After the mere move, the former 6th grade teacher deemed excellent, who made the switch, began demonstrating negative growth comparable levels of negative growth experienced by the teacher who left. While EVOS claims to account for team teaching dynamics by partitioning out different teachers' value-added effects, it's also unclear whether the proportion of teaching time per student can truly be accounted for given the interaction effects that occur among teachers and students in the collaborative and complex team teaching environments. All other findings can be found in the manuscript, but the bottom line is this. In theory, value-added models are supposed to allow for richer analysis of student test score data and therefore help us improve teaching by better evaluating it. The reality is that students are all unique individuals, and no matter how sophisticated the statistics, these things simply cannot be controlled. Some of these not mentioned here include 1. Students' parents' and families' contributions 2 after-school programs that impact what gains and losses can actually be attributed to students' teachers. 3. Students' summer gains and losses in learning. 4. Tutoring and supplementary programs that again confuse statements like Teacher G caused students A through Z to learn X. And of course, 5. Student motivation. Whether students are even motivated to do well on these tests is not nearly discussed enough. These are all factors that contribute to a teacher's value added, but unfortunately people are quick to assume that because measuring a teacher's value added makes sense, then it must work. We have proven this assertion false with this study. There is also more to come.